good evening and, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's really amazing to see so many familiar faces and also actually some unfamiliar ones um, uh, here tonight to help us celebrate Marina Otero and her 2022 Wheelwright Fellowship or prize. Uh, Marina's Wheelwright Research Project is entitled Future Storage, Architectures to Host the Metaverse, aspects of which we'll be hearing about tonight under the title Data Morning, um, but I'm going to let Marina introduce her work, that part of her work. So thinking about how to introduce Marina early today, I wasn't really sure where to start. Uh, there's just so many important aspects of her work and her contributions to architecture and design, uh, curatorial, pedagogical, scholarly, institution, building, critical, all the facets of a disciplinary apparatus that we care about and care about transforming uh, in CCCP. So I'll start here at GISA. Marina graduated from the CCCP program in 2013 with an award for high academic achievement, I should add, and went on to be the director uh, of global network planning at GSAP Studio X from 2013 to 2015. Uh, and that was the, ne the network of research laboratories launched by Dean Mark Wigley in around 2008, I believe, yeah. Um, in 2016, Marina received her PhD in the theory of architectural design from ETSAM in Madrid with a remarkable thesis entitled Evanescent Institutions, Political Implications of Itinerant Architecture, soon to come out as a book, yes. Um, that same year, as part of the After Belonging Agency, a collective of GSAP graduates, she co-curated the 2016 Oslo Architecture Triennale, After Belonging, the Objects, Spaces, and Territories of the Ways We Stay in Transit, or that's a catalog title, uh, going on two years later to curate the Dutch National Pavilion uh, their exhibition for the 16th Venice International Architecture Biennale with an incredible uh, project titled Work, Body, Pleasure. Clearly, Marina doesn't actually practice too much leisure, I should add, at least not in person, uh, for these major research-based exhibitions are in fact just the tip of the iceberg of her resume of curatorial work, which also includes biennales and triennales in Istanbul, in Sao Paulo, in Vienna, in Shenzhen, in Shanghai, and much more between 2014 and 2021, even Marseille, actually. Uh, and she a often acts not only as a curator, but also as an exhibition designer. Moreover, these major achievements were on top of her uh, primary day jobs, we might call them, uh, and her teaching. From 2015 to the beginning of 2022, Marina was director of research at the Het Neue Institute, HNI, my Dutch is not so good, uh, in the Netherlands, where in addition to launching a series of important research and exhibition projects, like automated landscapes on automated labor, architecture of appropriation on squatting as a spatial practice, burnout, exhaustion on a planetary scale, and architectures of security, she launched an international open call for fellows and a reading room conference series, among so many other initiatives. Uh, and this too is far from a comprehensive list of initiatives seeking to center questions of social environmental justice, of feminist and queer perspectives, and the coexistence of human and non-human bodies, and to expand modes of collective practice and engagements with colonial legacies, among so much more. Many of these research projects and collaborations have ended up as published volumes, uh, like Lithium, seem to come, yeah, States of Exhaustion, uh, with fellow CCCP graduate Francisco Diaz and Anastasia Kubrak, uh, More Than Human, with Dean Andres Hake, Retreat, Unmanned, Architecture and Security, a series with Ethel Etel, Etel Barayona and Malkit Shoshan. Her sole authored book, as I mentioned earlier, Evanescent Institutions, will also, appear, it's, it's not out yet, is it? It's on its way. Yeah, it's in, yeah, on its way, I understand that. Uh, and again, even all of this is really the tip of the iceberg of her publication practice. Finally, Marina is currently head of the Masters in Social Design at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, having previously taught at the Royal College of Art in London, in Geneva, here at GSAP, at ETSAM, and more. So this impressive list of achievements is certainly testament to Marina's professionalism, uh, to her conceptual and intellectual brilliance, to her commitment to teaching and collaboration, and to rethinking the manifold sites, formats, and actors of architecture. So it offers a glimpse of her contribution to making architecture a more interesting field to be part of, for which we thank you. But such a list is hardly an effective means of describing her incredible generosity to those around her, or her qualities as a trusted friend and a much admired transformative activist in the field. 
Indeed, her unceasing commitment to her own work is matched only by the energy and support to which she brings to the work of those around her. And this was amply evident yesterday uh, in your uh, remarks to the CCCP students during thesis reviews. Um, and so, below, I could go on and on and on about Marina's achievements and her wonderful person. I think it's probably time to invite her to the podium uh, for her lecture. So please join me in welcoming Marina. Wow, uh, such a presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Felicity. Um, so beautiful to be here with uh, so many friends and feeling at home. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Dean Hake and to Mark and Felicity for the invitation. And yeah, so I'm gonna share a little bit of the work I'm doing for the Wheelwright uh, Prize. So it's a work in progress. So that means that, well, there are still initial arguments and findings, and I'm very happy to, uh, you know, engage in forms of public research through which I can share those uh, initial ideas and have feedback and conversations around them. I think for me it's very important to, uh, as the research progresses, to have these instances in which you can have moments of public scrutiny and public discussions. So yeah, today I, I decided to call it Data Morning because it's connected to part of the uh, you know, intuitions that I'm having in relation to where this project could uh, eventually end. The MCHAP07A0 is the largest quipu on display at the Museo Chileno de Arte Precolombino in Santiago, Chile. Dating from 1500, this quipu, not in Quequa, is one of the systems for recording information used by the Inca. It is composed of 586 camelid fiber knotted cords organized into eight sections of 10 sets, each with up to 13 sublevels of information holding 15, 22 items of data. The state officials, Okipu Kamayox, made and kept these devices to store census records, accounts, genealogies, poems, songs, and the deeds and exploits of prominent figures. Each string is capable of reflecting millions of different combinations of color, fiber type, knot direction, to hold an enormous variety and quantity of knowledge. Together, these sequences create a binary code, a binary coded system whose mathematical organization anticipates the operations of the computer. The quipus, as part of an extensive infrastructure, allowed for the transfer of information throughout the Inca Empire. They coalesced the polities economy and the storage system, facilitating the coordination of crop harvesting, cotton and wool production, raw material availability, and the management of stocks across geographies, climatic regions, and astronomical cycles. Throughout history, empires have relied on communication networks to circulate products, information, and knowledge to manage resources and their complex societal organizations. The Inca Trail is not an exception, and its remains across the Chilean territory have been occupied and repurposed by colonial, modern, and neoliberal infrastructures. Paths transitioned by chasquis, runners or messengers, who carried quipus, and llamas moving materials and products turned into an intricate global communication system dependent on the exploitation, management, and supply of natural resources. To the Inca Empire, the quipu was what data infrastructure is to contemporary global markets. In this age when data centers encode and process immense amounts of information, quipus remain largely undecipherable. In, if their long-kept stories were to be read, the quipus will transform the understanding of the Inca Empire and its social organization, whose history, due to the lack of written records, has been told primarily by Spanish colonizers, my ancestors. 
As with today's digital networks, disentangling the Kipu's cords involves decoding their knots, a task comparable to comprehending the workings of contemporary digital infrastructures. Yet the intricacy of digital infrastructure is not the only challenge. The climate catastrophe makes it necessary to reinvent the data, how data is managed, produced, circulated, and stored if the industry is to deliver the promise of artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and the metaverse without causing planetary meltdown. Interestingly, when it seems that we have reached the limit of our shared world, its resources, and we are aware of the perils of equating progress to infinite growth, then we take refuge in the digital world where the promise of infinite possibilities is still present. A world that is generally imagined as a space without limits. The cloud where everything is possible. The metaverse, for example, promises a space in which to inhabit worlds and bodies, to have experiences to which we could not have access in our daily lives. It is a place in which to try out other ways of living and organizing society, other forms of coexistence. But this rehearsal space has important material repercussions, and it's not infinite. It has real limits. It is made up of cables that transmit information across oceans, extraction sites, servers, and data centers where our information is stored. Emails, images, selfies, TikTok videos. Data centers where servers, like these ones, work all day long, every day of the year, consuming vast amounts of information, water, and emitting CO2, so that we can stay connected. This is the sound of our emails. Not far from the MCHAP 0780 Kipu, a new infrastructure connecting data centers and mining sites across the Pacific Ocean is about to make, yet again, the Andean region a communication hub. The Humboldt Cable, the first submarine cable connecting Valparaiso and Sydney, will turn Chile into a preferred data center location and an epicenter of the struggles around green, connected digital futures. Chile is also the second largest producer of lithium, a critical element for phones, electric vehicles, solar panels, and data center batteries, present in only a few places on Earth in high concentration. The Salares in the Atacama Desert are one of them. Ancestral cosmologies and the prospects of the planet's futures collapse in the Salar de Atacama. The territory, once part of the Inca Trail, is occupied by one of the largest brine-based lithium mines in the world. Site of human, animal, vegetal, and microbial coexistence for thousands of years, the Salar is endangered by lithium extraction processes, processes involving the evaporation of millions of liters of water in the world's driest desert. Processes aimed at producing the batteries that power the continuous supply of information on our screens and the data centers where this information is stored. Whereas mineral extraction has been an ongoing activity in Atacama, it was what attracted the Incas to the territory and instigated the domination of the existing Atacameño communities. The scale of today's operation is putting is putting the entire ecosystem at risk of disappearance. Our low latency futures are granted at the expense of the Salares, environmental destruction, and dispossession of the indigenous communities who have been their stewards for generations. This is the cadaster and the mining, mining concessions in Atacama. It's quite packed. Atacama, despite its Hyperbiodiversity is instrumentally portrayed as a lifeless space. Mining companies treat the landscape as one of the biggest repositories of resources and therefore a major, major economic asset. Managers and engineers impose their abstract logistical models on the land following cravings for productivity and corporate profit. 
extending over the salaries, the Cartesian grid specialized their ambitions. The grid creates a blueprint for the ground's exploration. It also dominates the aerial perspective of the, the colorful brine ponds, whose beautiful shots smoothly circulate in media, and whose aesthetic experience eclipses the social and environmental destruction that fails them. Regardless of the grids, the Atacameño know that their ground is alive. They know that the minerals exported from the Atacama to other territories around the world are not lifeless matter. They are not commodities, a designation that has been used to justify their destruction, but microorganisms native to the desert and an intrinsic part of a living ecosystem. Indigenous leaders such as Rolando Humire are also aware of the rapid degradation of the salares, their inhabitants, and the symbiotic relations between them. Drought, contamination, and death resulting from the extraction of lithium and other minerals in the region are a byproduct of the global de dependence on energy and data, and the predictions that assume the ine inevitability of its growth. Yet it will be naive to consider that the landscapes of resource extraction are restricted to a Cartesian grid laid over the desert. Atacama's ground is entangled as a kipus knot with the technologies we use, cars we drive, architectures we inhabit, public officials we elect. There are plenty of examples of these enmeshments. Early in 2022, Chile's Ministry of Mining awarded, through an international tender process, two lithium extraction contracts to China-based Build Your Dreams and Chile-based Servicios y Operaciones Mineras del Norte to extract up to 80,000 metric tons of metallic lithium. The tender was aimed, according to Chile's right-wing government, at increasing lithium production in Chile to meet the growing global demand generated by develop development in areas such as digital infrastructure and electromobility. Many societal sectors opposed the tender, which was carried out controversially right before the new administration, led by left-wing politician Gabriel Boric, took power last March. Nevertheless, the lithium tender process had been long planned by those with interest in the business, like Build Your Dreams, China's leading manufacturers of lithium batteries and battery-powered electric vehicles. Controlling lithium extraction will mean control the entire market, from mine to end product. The introduction of autonomous transportation in cities will demand the construction of data centers able to support the constant real-time transfer required to relay information to users via smartphone applications powered by lithium batteries. Companies like Build Your Dreams sell products that generate a demand for more of their products. Their automated factories run at the rhythm of always anticipated growth, a rhythm that connects the smart city promises with the processes of natural resource extraction that are destroying ecosystems such as the Atacama as a reminder of what it takes to build our dreams. Today's data infrastructures are intertwined across geographies, policies, mines, fiber optic cables, switch points, mobile telephone towers, automated ports, and factories, and by extension, the spaces of everyday life. Contemporary data-driven society embodies what I call Cartesian enclosure, a spatial and epistemic system that extends beyond the more visible grid, their knots coalescing in seemingly unassuming architectures such as the data centers. Despite their apparent banality, these architectures are critical for current and future political, cultural, and socioeconomic activities. Their functioning depends on extractive practices and increasing land, water, and energy consumption. Data centers sustained and presidential digital data production aimed at creating alternative future worlds. And it's not only outpacing the scalability of today's storage solutions, but actually putting the only world we all inhabit at risk. Governments pressured by local communities, environmental movements, and rising energy prices 
have started to impose controls. Several data center hubs, including countries such as Singapore and the Netherlands or cities like Dublin, are implementing temporary bans on data center construction due to their excessive land energy consumption at the detriment of nearby residents. In June 2022, Chile also took measures affecting the lithium supply chain and consequently the extraction of a main component of digital infrastructures. Following a series of appeals filed by the Atacama indigenous communities of Camar and Coyo against the violation of the right to live in a pollution-free environment, the third chamber of the Chilean Supreme Court canceled the results of the tender process for lithium exploitation. With this decision, the Supreme Court confirmed that any intervention on ancestral territories or that might affect indigenous communities requires consultation in accordance with the current Chile's constitution. These and other episodes demonstrate the importance of demanding new paradigms for procuring, consuming, and storing energy and data. They stress the need for another eco-social models for digital infrastructures. Forecasts, however, continue to say otherwise. According to them, data generated globally is expected to grow at 23% annually from 2020 to 2025. Gardner, in its report, How Much Is Not Enough, refers to a coming zone of potential insufficiency and estimates that data storage demand could potentially soar to 50% from 2020 throughout 2030. Growth, according to these estimates, seems inevitable. And growth incentivizes markets. As a result, data center architecture becomes not only a site of a struggle, but a critical site of investment. It is not a coincidence that the largest commercial real estate services company globally recently launched a data center division. Architecture engineer firms such as Corgan, Hensler, Aecom, Arup are also expanding their data center divisions. Companies, universities, governments are joining forces to develop alternative models that will consume less energy and emit less CO2. Underwater data centers refrigerated directly by ocean waves Decentralized edge computing and micro centers that could be managed at the individual or neighborhood level. Hologram, fluorescent dye, crystal, and DNA data storage systems and quantum technologies are also some of the proposals making the news. None of them, however, account for data production and consumption behaviors that reduce the dependence on growth. They all assume the inevitability of increasing data production. And in turn, they fuel the extraction of more resources, the placement of new submarine cables, the construction of more data centers, the production of more batteries, often to the detriment of local communities across the world. The industry has built more than 8 million data centers in the last 10 years, which together consume 3% of the global electricity and emit the same amount of greenhouses, greenhouse gas as the aviation industry and growing. These numbers and the struggles that follow them have instigated the creation of a new European code of conduct for energy efficiency in data centers. However, these and other attempts to make data centers more efficient have failed so far. In areas in London, it is not possible to build new homes because they will not have access to electricity. The grid is already stretched by data center consumption. In the Nordic countries, the development of digital infrastructures and green energy futures also comes at the expense of local and indigenous peoples. The expansion of wind farms is having a dramatic effect on the environment and culture of the Sami. As with lithium mines, wind farms are part of the decarbonization effort essential to tackle the worst impacts of climate change. 
Yet, by invading the reindeer pastures and displacing the animals for their usual grazing lands, the wind farms are endangering a cultural practice essential to Sami identity. The existence and functioning of these farms is an essential element of the booming data center industry in the Nordic country region. This data center industry has been enabled by favorable tax conditions, cold climate, and the expansion of renewable energy infrastructures that provide data centers with opportunity to, to attain a green energy label. Along with data centers come other data-related activities. This is a cryptocurrency mine in Boden, uh, Sweden. Found of the energy consumed by Bitcoin mining. The surplus heat generate, uh, generated by crypto mining operations is redirected to a neighborhood, uh, a neighborhood called next door, door greenhouse, where it is used to foster the growth of plants and vegetables. The energy consumption, however, remains excessive and insufficient to justify the entire operation. This is RISE, it's a research center in Luleo in Sweden that were some prototypes for future data centers. They also use surplus heat in greenhouses they design. But also they grow worms, fish in fish farms, and dry wood that is later used as biomass. Worms were the most successful of the three applications. Worms are fed to chickens which would otherwise eat imported dry food. The chickens are, according to rice, very happy. And the process responds to a circular economy in the region. Our digital files generate heat. The heat generates worms. The worms feed the chickens. And the humans eat the chickens to send more emails. <laughs> this is a data center in downtown Stockholm. Part of the energy generated by the servers is transferred to the city's heating network. Our emails could also heat homes. And besides, some of these data centers include civil, civic functions. This is a cafe during the day and disco bar at night, part of the data center. Still, most of them run on hydroelectric energy from dams, and wind farms whose functioning affects, again, indigenous and local communities. In what many have described as green colonialism, the projects often ignore the harm caused by these infrastructures and communities in the name of sustainability, treating them as externalities. Some judges still make a difference. In October 21, the Norwegian Supreme Court wrote that part of the largest onshore wind farm in Europe violated Article 27 of the UN International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The Norwegian, the Chilean, even the Dutch ruling demonstrate the importance of consultation and collaboration with local communities in ensuring climate justice, steps that government and companies usually do not follow. As a result, some communities develop their own programs. Stewart Stacey, Managing Director of Binary Security, made the news by starting the world's first indigenous operated data center in Charles Darwin University in Australia. This initiative instigates indigenous governance over the creation of collection, ownership, stewardship, analysis, and application of data. Binary security is not alone. Kalinda IT Services, an indigenous-owned business, has recently partnered with Trifalga DC to develop a network of hyperscale and edge data centers across Australia. Designers like Ibille Camp also contribute to this shift. As a cultural, economic, and strategic asset, data is, according to Camp, generally mobilized against vulnerable populations. Yet it could also be, she claims, a vehicle for restitution. In her work, Camp explores how data materializes in Western Africa landscape. The African continent has a shortage of data centers, partially due to power outages and the reliance on diesel generation generators. 
As a result, most of Africa data is stored in Marseille in France. Still, various countries, including Nigeria, the larger hub of data centers in West Africa, is attaining significant investment from overseas organizations. This development, camps shows, disregard the realities of the inhabitants and lack ethical processes around Western companies' policies for data collection, management, and control. In this surveilled environment, CAMP argues for the incompleteness of data and the unintentional disruptions in digital technology as a form of resistance to counteract the multinational control over the city and its inhabitants. The MCHAP0780 Kipu, found in an Incan cemetery in Arica, Chile, a meticulous study of its notes allowed for the tabulating of 15, 22 units in different categories whose meaning are still unknown. In the early moments of colonization, Hispanic writing was prioritized over the Kipu system of strings, which was largely illegible to the colonizers. Later, around 1570s, the Kipus will achieve colonial recognition as records and will start to be admitted in legal and administrative contexts. And the litigants could then read the strings in lawsuits concerning issues such as tribute restitution. Granting legitimacy, however, was part of the policy adopted by Francisco de Toledo, the new viceroy, who sought the establishment of order in the Andes to optimize the extraction of resources on a national scale. For that purpose, he ordered forced relocation of Andean population to Hispanic type settlements and the establishment of the system of cabildos, municipal councils, where officials could transcribe the information of each community's quipus. During that time, quipus will also provide the strategies for daily resistance against colonial rule, subverting the Catholic imposition of confession or facilitating the planning of uprisings through Kipu messages, illegible to colonial officials. Similar episodes trigger what has been described as the colonizers' fear for the noted rogue, which ultimately resulted in the prohibition of the Kipu by the Catholic Church in 1583, during the third session of the Limense Provincial Council. Not many Kipus survive. And despite the occasional transcription of accounting kipus by the colonial administration, these records were not kept together with the kipus or daily illustration, therefore rendering the relations between lasting material evidence and its meaning unreadable. Paradoxically, today's digital infrastructure is seen as a key to unlock the kipus secrets and protect them from decay and the passing of time. Developments in artificial intelligence and other digital tools are, to many scholars, crucial in the efforts to decipher kipus and their iteration of colors and knots. The more than 850 digitalized kipus around the world are a de facto database that could be studied resorting to trained computer algorithms and microanalysis. Large-scale pattern, Patterns and similarities could emerge from studying these digital reproductions and simulations by anthropologists, archaeologists, historians, linguists, and mathematicians. The attraction to the enigmatic nature of kipus and the desire to unpack those chronicles of the Andean past embodied in their knots resorts, I will argue, to the same logic that puts at risk the very landscapes and communities where kipus were once born. Academic and scientific efforts in collecting, archiving, cataloging, digitizing, analyzing, and ultimately deciphering kipus are part of a historical lineage that connects with the European colonial order and its material, cultural, and epistemic genocide. Transforming the kipus in digital assets and databases implies subjecting once more indigenous knowledge and cosmovision. Their knots link the bodies, ecosystems, knowledges erased by colonization 
with those at risk of disappearing by contemporary extractivist violence. Against the compulsion to decode the Kipu's information and render it transparent, the acceptance of their opacity stands as a decolonial practice. Only by accepting their inscrutability, we could recognize that what was destroyed by colonization was not only the knowledge to code and decode Kipus, but the situated social, cultural relations organized around them, leaving the surviving courts as empty figures, empty signifiers, and evidence of the violence of erasure deployed by colonialism. Or as Glisson beautifully puts it, we should accept the inanitilegibility that often characterized cross-cultural communication as opposed to the transparency as epistemological modality of colonial power. By reconsidering the relevance of data-driven society and the search for limitless production, consumption, and storage of data, we could perhaps undo the knots that tie up the mining industry and extractivist economies with logistical and communication networks, the knots that tie up human dreams with the logic of growth, and perhaps then embrace a different way of being in the world. In any case, as this image shows, over time, digital data, as kipus, turn indecipherable. What you see is a folder of photographs taken in 2007, and that remain on a storage device for nine years. The code did not change over time, but the computer's perception of this code shifted, making it unreadable. Data corruption and disappearance demonstrates the interconnectedness between digital and physical realms. Over time, our millions of files will face the same fate that those ecosystems affected by their storage. Those communities affected those territories in Portugal that are fighting new lithium mines, or in the Netherlands that are fighting data centers that are consuming far too much energy, water, and emitting CO2, or in Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina fighting lithium extraction in Los Salares. Data is, after all, a finite resource. The inevitability of its decay it's a reminder of the fragility of the digital and physical world, our environments, bodies, and histories. In this context, instead of a race for new systems of data storage, plagued with externalities, I argue for a practice of letting go of digital data, individual and collective. Just as we mourn the loss of physical objects, places, and people, Letting data go also requires a mourning process, one that recognizes digital data's emotional and cultural significance. Instead of accepting the inevitability of growth and aiming for a frictionless storage medium that will allow for limitless accumulation, even beyond the human, I say let's embrace the need for new practices for letting data go. Driven by a fear of extinction and loss, most of scientific market-driven data storage remedies hold an empty promise of keeping information unaffected by the passing of time. But they fail to acknowledge that any archival holding is continually renewed renew through practices of maintenance, that meanings are transformed as they are continually performed, and that remembering simultaneously concerns knowledge generation and its loss. Data storage, as archives, are immersed in states of proliferation and decay. Memory is not what is contained and stored, but a dynamic practice that involves acts of remembering and forgetting. Through states of gradual decomposition and recomposition, future meanings emerge that exceed the intention and interpretations of those who deposited and stored them. Thank you. Joining Marina briefly at the 
podium to, to thank her and maybe ask a question or two before we field what I'm sure are um, uh, many great questions from the audience after that incredible lecture. It's like so beautiful to hear where the research is going and the sort of incredible set of, of connections that you're drawing from, from Chile back again <laughs> like, um, through uh, such a complicated framework that that, uh, so I was actually gonna hand the podium straight over to Mark, but, but since I'm on a roll, I'm not really on a roll, but I'll go a little bit here. Um, I, I, um, I mean, I think the, the, the complicated sort of diagrams and circuits and, and reprisals of, of geographies of colonial violence and indigenous genocide and, and environmental destruction was entirely uh, extraordinary. And, and I, hadn't exactly understood how the project was going to connect these pieces and or the role of the lithium. And, and so again, it was like incredibly um, helpful for me to watch that. If I have a question, I'm gonna ask a really dumb question. And, and it maybe takes off from um, where you ended around the question of mourning and, um, and this process of mourning or of letting go. And, and I'd written earlier, um, you had a slide that asked the question to save or not save data. Um, and, uh, and it was affiliated with a, uh, you know, a classic sort of capitalist uh, graph going up and to the right, you know, marking the sort of necessary exponential growth of capitalist development that, that of course, was precisely the, the impetus for colonial expansion in the first place. And, and I, I um, but I, I wrote down like, um, how is data disposed of? And I know that's not entirely your question. Your question is, how is data let go? But I started to think, um, you know, what, what is the, the energy output or the sort of material afterlife of even a process of, of data destruction or of data letting? I mean, I understand that if the project is to temper uh, the sort of expectation of exponential growth, yeah, of, of ever more need for manufacturing data centers powered by lithium batteries that you know drive this process of extraction. Um, is there? I mean, it's a stupid question, but is there a is there a, f um, a footprint on the ground of letting data go? You know, beyond the psychological, like how is data shed? Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah. How yeah, do you yeah. destroy data? Like, <laughs> do you just cease to fuel it, or no? I mean, I know it's a sort of a dumb question, but but if it's a process, yeah, I mean, pro yeah, it, it would seem potentially to tie into yeah other factors. I mean, and just one other, you know, I sort of struck listening to you. Uh, I remember this moment in the um, the pandemic when everybody was, you know, turning to to uh, fully online lives or more or less fully online lives where, um, where the statistic of, 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 of energy consumption, I mean, prior to that, I'm trying to remember their names, um, sort of Dutch scholars who, who had acknowledged that even by 2021, the, the fuel consumption of, of managing data would, um, would outpace um, uh, that produced by airline, you know, the environmental destruction produced by airline travel. And it struck me all of a sudden, yeah, this sort of horrible paradox of the mm -hmm. massive sort of exponential increase in data use. I know that's a different question, but, but I was like thinking with that, um, that the sort of idealism that we were no longer burning fuel to fly around the world, but like, I mean, I, I'm just, it's sort yeah, of that paradox. Absolutely. Like, how, how is data, sh like, yeah, is there a, so, hmm. I mean, the project, um, the idea was very naive in terms of studying data centers. I'm trying mm -hmm. to not to, you know, have a free judgment. So I still want to do the all the field work mm -hmm. because I think it's important to visit all these places. And I selected a range of data centers that were well known because mm -hmm. of their ecological practices. So not even the most horrible ones, <laughs> the ones that are supposed to reuse energy and mm -hmm. consume less. And, but what I do is also trace, you know, follow the pipelines, like the tubes, mm -hmm. the pipes that go from the data centers to some other places that are wind farms or 
hydroelectric dams or and interestingly enough you find so many externalities mm -hmm. connected mm -hmm. to these data centers most of the time these externalities are the same type of population local indigenous population so i went to the nordic countries where is one of the most important location for data centers and you know that's what happens that uh, the booming industry uh, many many data centers are located there because mm -hmm. they can have the green energy label and generally you have the information in two data centers so you can locate one in the nordic countries and the other in uh, nevada mm -hmm. but still because you have one in the nordic countries you have energy uh, green energy label but having all this green energy infrastructure has an important effect on many other ecosystems mm -hmm. and environments. Mm -hmm. So that's how, uh, you know, suddenly this question about um, even the most efficient data centers actually, yeah. you know, have a very dramatic effect. Or the indigenous so. data center. I mean, I think that was a really poignant that, moment. That's interesting. Which also integrated yeah. indigenous people into the, yeah, the, destructive, the cycle of destruction of their environment. I mean, I thought that was a particularly cynical. Yeah, I mean, in the case of <laughs> in that particular yeah. one, I think it's a long uh, standing, uh, you know, a struggle against the surveillance of the Australian mm -hmm. uh, government on on uh, indigenous populations. So there's mm -hmm. also the it makes sense to have your own data center and manage your organization. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, so data images and so on, even the mm -hmm. ones that we have here and we don't use, they are consuming uh, mm -hmm. energy continuously. Uh, so even the ones that are corrupted and are in decay and we cannot even access, they still consume energy. Um, so eventually even like if we are not actively, actively disposing of data, we'll mm -hmm. also consume energy, but will be a moment of mm -hmm. consumption. So maybe what I have in mind, but mm -hmm. maybe this is a more artistic practice, mm -hmm. is like, you know, there are rituals in which, you know, moments that also society have around letting go of things. Mm -hmm. And there is something we have to acknowledge about the digital that there should be certain practices around that. I'm not necessarily positioning it in the individual, but I find it interesting that most of the relation we have to data is about creating and producing more, keeping more. So mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. interactions we have with companies is like Google, Gmail telling you that you have, you can have more storage uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. Dropbox telling you you have more storage capacity. Each iPhone that goes into the market has more storage capacity. So it's everything projected towards the idea that more storage capacity is never about like why we need so much information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the science information, even if it's redundant, it's not extremely interesting, is potentially could be an economic asset in the future because we'll be part of a database or you know for training algorithms or something that we don't know yet so we are just keeping accumulating data for certain companies to make profit in the future um, betting on the you know on the possibility of profit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and putting at risk a very present uh, that we all share so for me that's um, so it's a provocation to say data morning because I don't want to pro uh, propose only deleting data. We can all now, you know, mm -hmm. collectively, you know, delete some of the images we have. But I think there is a process, like a ritual, collective practice of understanding, having a different relation with data. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to. Uh, you know, propose. Uh. Hard to know how to follow up on that incredibly beautiful talk, but also your very careful articulation of our complex relationship to, to data historically, technically, effectively. Um, but I was also struck by that diagram, and I think it's the same one. And if I read it correctly, it was labeled zone of insufficiency. And, and I was thinking when you're talking, like every now and again, architects dip into the world of data storage. And, and I thought, this is, this is a familiar story, but then as you kept going, it becomes so much stranger. And it's like coming back to this narrative, again, we realize things have happened. We haven't been paying attention. And, and you've brought, um, you've signaled our own, let's, let's call it kind of cognitive zone of insufficiency when it comes to this issue. And I, I, and I thought it was just incredible to see where this is going and, and the proliferation not of only environmental degradation, but of, different forms of investment, but also 
different forms of refusal because I guess my question would be what the relationship is for you between mourning and refusal and, and whether it'd be such a thing as data refusal in your story. Because it also seems like the, the way you've linked the possibility of mourning or refusal to problematics of environmental justice or other forms of justice, it seems like there could be, through that refusal, something like an emerging data justice at stake. And, mm -hmm. and so I also followed your thinking of the relationship between the informational and the physical and through that diagram of the cable. But I also just started to think about where else we could see that problematic of data justice. And, and this is going to be, sorry to talk about my own work here, but just because it so <laughs> touches, the thing that we just did so touches on your project that we, we interviewed a bunch of immigrants in, in Greece recently. And, and what we learned is that the proliferation of informational systems on places like the European border, especially through Frontex, mm -hmm continues along the same kind of growth path as you've shown here. And these are forms of overlapping jurisdiction of informational extraction. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that, that in that proliferation, in that overlap, in that informational accumulation, once you enter those data banks, uh, uh, Interpol, a Frontex data bank, your information gets repeated in other data banks and other data banks. And, and this is how your movement as a non-documented immigrant gets controlled and constrained and resisted. So there's something about those forms of accumulation, the territories of information extraction that they're related to, also provoke slightly different questions of data justice and what that would mean to refuse and who has the capacity to refuse in cases like that. And, and so it's, it just seems like it's, it's not so much extraction, it's just like a kind of proliferation of recording of identity that you can't control but that is used against you. And so how to think refusal in those contexts as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if that touches on your project at all. Yeah, I think there's a part of acknowledgement of the ruination as a process that we have to have empathy towards um, in the ecological sense. So understanding a mourning as a, I think, uh, as a, a practice that is become more and more important to acknowledge the many ways in which we have to live differently. Mm. And there are ways to let go of data mm. or many other forms in which we are used to live that require processes of mourning and celebration. So when I say mourning, it's not only necessarily you know, crying for data, <laughs> <laughs> but there is like, and I, I'm, I'm relying on a Latin American uh, activists and artists like Naomi Rencon Gallardo and others like the question of desire um, connected mm -hmm. to life and death, but not a compulsive desire of capitalism or individual desire, but a collective desire for life, an erotic desire that has to do with these processes that involve proliferation, decay, um, and you know, disappearance as well. You know? So I think that for me is, is beautiful, and that's why I think mourning in relation to data could be, you know, productive. Obviously, there is uh, different layers that uh, are at play, like um, um, some of them, for instance, will be commercial enterprises. <laughs> um, I didn't mention, but Marie Kondo is not in the business of, you know, asking you to do, you know, to order things and throw them away. Uh, in your houses. Actually, she has partnered with Google and is now advising all of us on how to tidy up our, you know, uh, email uh, inbox. So, <laughs> soon, <laughs> there will be, I mean, this, this is something. I mean, this is something. There is, this zone of potential insufficiency is real. And the data center bans that are happening in many places only show the difficulty. And if you talk with any provider of data centers, there is a problem there. Um, in terms of resources, space, energy, availability. So I'm not going to do a like, uh, black mirror thing now here. <laughs> but many people uh, in, in, in investment banks and, uh, are speculating on the probability that uh, the access to data will be much more restricted than it is now. 
It's also mm -hmm. the possibility of accumulating data as we are doing now. It's not something that is gonna continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And things that I always imagine that I really don't understand why they are for, like NFTs, mm -hmm. suddenly have another meaning. Because the fact that you have that file, that you are the owner of that file, of the basketball uh, player, you know, that you are gonna be the only one because the rest of us will not be a affording, we will not be able to afford to have uh, storing data. So there are many different layers uh, about this potential insufficiency that point to forms of um, yeah, inequality. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we are living in this moment where this proliferation of data is pervasive and we are used to it, but I, many people are betting on that's not the case. So on the one hand, there is the market trends towards like generating more information and profiting from these endless databases. And there are others who are profiting from the idea that this is gonna be actually a, a scarce, a, um, a, a scarce uh, resource. Uh, resistance. Well, it's difficult in that paradox, yeah. you know? So, um, yeah. Who should we? Yeah, maybe over yeah. here. I don't know. Yeah, there's a microphone. Um. Hi, Marina. Thank you so much for your time and the talk. Um, my name's Sam, and I have so many questions, <laughs> but the one I'll ask first. Um, you might not have any thoughts on this, but when you are doing this in research and visiting data centers, I'm curious, because they're in these rural areas, does the location of data centers give any geopolitical power to these organizations or communities beyond just the fact that they're private for that company itself? Because I saw, for example, the Australia example where they're hiring indigenous um, people to work at the data centers. Does the location of these data centers affect the political power that these communities might have in relation to government on a national scale or in relation to these companies at all? You mean all the communities the, that are around the data centers? Yes, as well as the, co the companies under which the data centers are under, the companies which own the data. Because for security reasons, if the local people have more access to these places physically, and I don't know if that creates any complications. The example that I have in mind specifically is the Belt and Road Initiative in China. And that's a very large scale project with very different jurisdictional um, scenarios. But the give and take from some opinion pieces that I've read is just that by placing these data centers in the country surrounding, not relying on themselves, there's a cer certain negotiation that happens between the traveling of the data around? Um, so most of the uh, data centers, how the location is uh, chosen, most of the times is not even following planning, coding, and everything. Mm -hmm. So the companies, for instance, in the case of the Netherlands, negotiate directly with the government, and they have tax uh, breaks um, and you know many facilities with the promise that they will generate uh, employment for a local population, which never happens, because these places, they don't have a large population working within them. So generally, the local population has a very strange relation with these very unassuming and enclosed environments. Um, and there's a relation of suspicion uh, around it. So basically, also architects, generally what they do is design you know, the environment around data centers to make them more acceptable by local population. Until quite recently, they were like their strange neighbor. And you know, most of the time, there was not such a transfer of economies or you know, knowledge between one and the other. But because of the energy situation, uh, that has become you know, the more uncomfortable neighbor. So it has been energy, the reason why there has been different tensions between communities and data centers, uh, energy and water. So the condition of these data centers is interesting because on the one hand, they are extremely local because they depend on the 
tax rebates, like um, land, uh, the price of land. So many times is the price of land what allows them climatic conditions, availability of energy, availability of water, etc. So they are very con connected to the local environment, and at the same time they are completely disconnected. So it's a very paradoxical situation between very situated local engagement mm. and totally disconnected global. In, uh, uh, mm. So that's why you know there is a very tense relation between the the populations. Most of the times, um, they are not located in the city centers, or they are like in rural areas. That um, in the city centers we don't see them that often, but they are. And in these locations that I've been uh, when actually um, their presence was not so much discussed until there was an issue with energy prices. And then, as happens in London, there has a priority. What is the priority? Is like having data proliferate and be circulated or having electricity at home. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of very particular relations in each of the cases. Thank you, Marina, for a fantastic talk. Um, I'm just curious, and slides were very compelling and about the sonic landscapes of this. The only volume that we heard or noise was in your presentation was from the slides that the data centers were emitting and related to their relationship to the surrounding communities. I know that domestically there's been some lawsuits in Arizona from the emittance of this noise. And some of those images are so kind of pastoral and they speak to silence and that tension, that dissonance. Just what around sonics have you come across and thoughts on maybe the you know, destruction of silence and accompaniment with this? Yeah, it's a thing that it's interesting to, um, in the research, to include other mediums through which to understand data. And um, when you visit a data center, the first thing you notice is this noise, which is quite unbearable. So people working inside data centers generally has to protect their ears. So for me, it was important to establish different understandings of how data circulation operates and what are the different effects that they have. And this sound landscapes is something that I still want to explore more, but uh, I find it interesting to play with them a little bit. Especially, for instance, the crypto um, noise is uh, it's a completely different landscape. So suddenly this sound landscape creates a, a very particular condition where this smoothness of data and the digital this idea of the digital that we have and the cloud suddenly is disrupted. Because if I tell you that you know every time that you are taking a selfie, you are consuming half of the energy that a car has, uh, um, you know, driving one kilometer, you get it. But probably if I just listen to the sound of uh, crypto, you understand what it implies, the workings of servers consuming energy and generating that kind of um, heat and energy surplus around them through sound. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to kind of understand these infrastructures in a different way. But our experiment so far. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. It's so wonderful to see you back at GSAP again. But I, I wanted to follow up on Felicity's question um, because it, it helped me sort of think about, because especially you're interested in the kind of architectural and material existence of these data centers and if you know the processors and everything have to get swapped out as the technology is changing, how is that also contributing to e-waste and where are those e-waste flowing? I had a you know, conversation recently with geographer Simone Brown, who's very interested in like, where does all that e-waste go and the ways in which it gets remined exactly for the lithium, for the rare earth, for the copper, you know, for all of these toxic materials. 
Um, and I think she, she refers to it something like the imperial landscape of algorithmic toxicity. It's like, yes, you mine it once, but then it's getting remined somewhere else, which is still linking back up to these colonial and imperial geographies. And I was just curious where you, have you been able to trace what happens once these things are obsolete and where it might go? Yeah, like who, who is managing their waste? Because no. there's gotta be a company sending it somewhere. No, but I, I, I was asking because I didn't know, for, for instance, how long, for how long you have a server in a data center, mm -hmm. and it's not that long. So they were telling me, like, um, now most of the servers are, you know, have to be using very specific climatic conditions, and they are refrigerated through uh, water systems, but air uh, mostly. And, but in the rise, this place in uh, Sweden, they have developed a technique that is refrigerating servers through oil, mineral oil. And it's very interesting because the servers are, you know, inserted in oil that refrigerates them and, you know, works very well. Um, but the companies that provide the servers, they don't like that solution because the servers work much more, like they, they last longer. Yeah. They don't have to be replaced every year. They can last for many years. So then for them, the kind of the economy and in which every the system is organized is disrupted by this technology. But I was discussing with most of the data centers I visited and most of them are gonna make the transition towards mineral oil. But that will probably, <laughs> I mean, not to speculate, but probably there will be a way in which those servers that will be submerged in the, they will also have to be changed every other year. You know. But uh, I don't know what happens with the service, but clearly there is a, a lot of waste that comes not only into you know, the processing of data, but all the data infrastructure and the servers that have to be replaced continuously. And then it's also the, the data centers where the servers are, is a 10% of the data center. Most of the space is occupied by uh, backup technologies that are there in case there is a blackout. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like layers and layers, and that's where the lithium batteries play a role. It's not that the servers use lithium, it's that the backup batteries, these lithium batteries have to last X number of minutes before the diesel generations start. Mm -hmm. So if there is a problem with the electricity, the lithium batteries start, and then they give time enough for diesel generators to start providing energy again to the server. So that is the most expensive and redundant uh, technologies that also have to be changed very often. So it's a, a huge operation that's, uh, yeah, it's quite, <laughs> yeah, mesmerizing and terrible. But yeah, I think you're right, I would like to follow also what happens, I, I've been following pipes that goes out of the data center and in, but I haven't uh, followed other materials that are going, but that's, that's so interesting. I think Laura and then you and then you, yes? So, you still have a question, yes? <laughs> Hey, Marina, what a, it was such a great lecture, so thank you. Um, but I just want to follow up on this redundancy um, thing because, and also relating back to something Felicity asked about deleting data. I actually don't think we know when our data has been deleted, most, most of the time. And the redundancy is, is so huge of the, of the backup systems that you're always protecting it not only in one place but in a few places that if you delete your own data, you don't know your data, right? So no. you never know that your data has been deleted, which is this whole thing in, in Europe about the, mm -hmm. the right to forget, yeah. which is not, um, not nearly as sophisticated here in the US as it is in Europe. And even in Europe, you can't, you can never prove that your data has been deleted. So I think this, the whole data morning and getting rid of your, I, I love the idea um, at the end, but it's, it's, it's built upon two kind of things that are impossible, right? The one to delete your data and the other that we've 
we're just um, collecting so much of our junk. You know, that, that's, the, that's the thing. Like all, when, you remember those statistics, um, you know, more data has been made than in the last 10 years than in the whole of human history. And it's just all our family photographs and our email and our, like things that you never thought could be um, useful in any way until, you know, um, the targeted ads. And the person who invented the targeted ads has apologized a million, you know, a million times. And it's because of the targeted ads that all of a sudden you could get the 900 points of data. I don't know. I'm just yeah, complicating this whole thing but of forgetting because I think it's, it's the think most, it's, the end was just so complex and so many knots in there that it would love to I think untie. it's interesting to try to say what it will mean to be able to delete or forget yeah. data because it's, it's, there is an impossibility. So it seems very easy, like, oh, it's like I delete some, but as you say, mm -hmm. first of all, yeah, uh, most of the data centers are, they have a mirror. Um, so yeah, where data is yeah. split, but also even like if you think about your devices, the cloud, whatever that means, and everything like within our own devices, if you send a WhatsApp image, you know, image in WhatsApp, and you don't have, and you send it to three or four people, and you don't have a yeah, so that you are storing ten images of the same. If you are not telling WhatsApp not to do it, uh, which most of the people don't. And the same. Uh, so we are storing many times the same image. That actually the, it's an image that maybe is like a meme of a cat. You know, I, lo I love them. But, and then actually it's mirrored into data centers into different parts of the world. And if you want to delete it, then because of certain uh, regulations, it has to be like X number of years until actually could act effectively deleted and you don't know if they will do it because maybe they know that you like cats and they <laughs> send you the announce for you know cat food As you, so and there is uh, many different diagrams explaining like the amount of dark data versus all this that is accumulated and no one knows exactly what it is and if it's any work but it's work because it is what they create in data, data sets, data sets for the future. We don't know what it is for, but in a moment, it will be helpful. So that's why it's a, this form of accumulation is a form of speculation. Yeah, so it's, it's an impossibility, but I think there is something there that will be worth exploring. Maybe uh, today, I w it's more in a metaphorical, artistic way, but it will be interesting to think about. I mean, my idea is to work also with in different frameworks. I would like to think through experimental preservation, um, through data, because I think there are many questions connected that we know how to delete things and maintain things and not others in many other frameworks, in archives, collections, built environment, and so on. But with digital, there is not such a conversation necessarily. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, working with you know, people who knows about how to delete a, <laughs> so actually a, a file, what it implies in the legal, in the questions. So that will be something that I would like to do in the next steps. But I think at, at the same time as I continue doing the field trips, because I think it's still important to give the chance to see how these things work <laughs> like, <laughs> properly. And then can Thank you. Um, I find this a very beautiful point about that all of our, you know, our current relationship to data, even if we don't acknowledge it, is very much not neutral. And this idea that there's so much work to be done to really rethink our relationship to, to data. Um, that being said, I think there, it's quite the, that there's so much work to do, partly because I think the presentation you've given has given many of these very spectacular presentations of data, but the truth is like a lot of the, uh, you know, as we say, a lot of this information is actually even less boring, even more boring than the, the cat meme, even more boring than, than the old photographs or the emails. It's just these like null lines that's, that are hidden behind everything we do. And in a sense, the a lot of the data industry is based on this sort of monopoly on this boredom, this, this fact that like Netflix, you know, grew up because no one was interested in this, like Mu Sigma, ZS, like 
Nielsen, they all grew up because none of the major consulting companies were interested in this. And so I'm curious if you have a thought, this is really focusing on the front end more so than tracing it to the source, but is there a way without literally tracing the, the pipelines that we can break this monopoly and boredom? How, how do you see the role of this sort of generalized disinterest um, and, you know, in the front end of like, I mean, maybe another way of phrasing this is like, what would it take for a person to actually have the discipline to look at their inbox and, and Marie Kondo their inbox? Label. Yeah, I mean, who has the time to do that? Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, who has the time to be sending memes all the time? And we, we do have it. <laughs> and to take selfies, and I don't have social media, I only have LinkedIn that is the most like, uh, you know. <laughs> um, um, so I think uh, it's a question of, yeah, class. It's a question of labor. Like it's like obviously it's, it involves labor to to engage in going to your inbox and deleting information. But it's a question also of uh, compulsivity of accumulation, because we do the same as companies. Like you don't delete things just in case just in case it's useful for something that we project into the future. So it's not only boredom, I think it's a kind of a form of compulsivity uh, and the need for accumulation and the projecting on the future continuously about the potential usefulness of data. Um, yeah, I don't think it's similar to Netflix in that sense. Um, I think it's another type of uh, psychological um, state that makes it and, and very ingrained in um, other forms of accumulation and consumption. So I think there's a tendency of like as consumers, what is our relation to information, not necessarily about <coughs> boredom. And about your point about the images, I agree, but I mean, most of the images are the ones that exist. So uh, like if you find them exciting, that's great. <laughs> but I mean, the data centers are quite you know, and assuming, but maybe uh, in the school of architecture, we love and assuming uh, stuff. I think we are also <laughs> of a perverted uh, aesthetic uh, interest. But there is a, it's a very interesting question. What is my relation with data and information mm -hmm. as I do the research? Because it's paradoxical. It's like, I have many files of <laughs> videos and sound of all these data centers. And then I'm talking about deleting information. So it's something that is also, uh, you know, worrying me. So I, <laughs> I talk, I mean, just to feel a bit less guilty, I talk with uh, someone uh, that has a magazine that is called Low Tech Magazine and it's in Barcelona. And they have a website that is uh, only dependent, I mean, it works because it has a server uh, using solar panels. Mm. So if there is not sun, which doesn't happen that often in Barcelona, um, the website is not up. And if there is not enough energy accumulated, the definition of the images is low resolution. Mm -hmm. So I was talking with this person, thinking that the way in which, I mean, I can give talks and somebody if I publish, um, I publish this as form of essays or videos and so on, will always be with them as a form of life that will be the place where the information will exist and in relation to that, which is not solving the issue, you know. I still have to think through my own practice. But, mm. So I appreciate your, your question about my own re relation to images, not that much about the aesthetic, which I also think that is productive. I have to think about it more, but about its relation to the topic I'm addressing. Hi, how are you? Thanks for starting this conversation, especially here in an architecture school, because I really do think it's important in two ways. One is, you know, we're talking a lot about like individual production of data. And really, you have to look at the corporations and the entertainment industry and the kind of data that, you know, I mean, the level, if you just compare it, it's just a million times more. But it does start in schools like here because we are training students to produce these incredible renderings mm -hmm. 
our render farms or our reliance on the kind of images, the image culture. I mean, to me, it's also the kind of cultural question, right? So I think that the the sort of I'm all with you for this letting go and you know kind of data mourning, but I think it perhaps it also starts at the end. You know, the start like where do we how do we produce it and who produces it and you know, just the culture. So I sort of feel like in Orchid, you know, we should start this movement. I've just been up at reviews here, and every time I see these incredible renderings and, you know, and the realistic images that, you know, so there it's also the question of software companies, right? The kind of, I mean, it's, I know it's a can of worms for you because, you know, you're talking about the data center, but the production end is where, you know, that, and that, to me, it's also, the, of course, the role of software companies, corporations, et cetera, but also um, Mabel's question of e-waste. You know, US is the only country who didn't sign the Basel Convention on e-waste. E mm -hmm. So there are things of, you know, regulations, et cetera. So I just was wondering, especially for your research with the data centers, like did you, you know, A, the role of software companies and two, the kind of the, the European Union has the, you know, strict regulations around data center and like what are you finding about all that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the question of where to put the emphasis, if it's at the end, like deleting or not producing, I think it's both obviously, you know. Um, for me, there is something that is much like as you point out like the individual production of data is quite considerable uh, but it's nothing compared to certain industries it's very easy perhaps to say that you know uh, software companies but actually the problem is that some of the industries that generate more data are ones that maybe we want them to generate data that is the health industry and then obviously we want to have databases to identify tumors quickly and you know, uh, NASA forms of astronomical, you know, uh, observation that are like, I've been talking with people working in NASA and they have data. like data centers and data centers because they are all the time collecting information. So there are like industries that then if we say, do we want to collect that data? Because then we have databases to analyze the origin of the universe or to cure an uh, illness. And then the question is like, well, I don't know. No? Um, so that complicates a little bit, like to put the blame on, obviously I put the blame on the corporations and, and the way in which they ins insist on, as I said, iPhone to create, to bring to the market an iPhone that has even more capacity. Why mm -hmm. we need that terabyte? But it's true that at the end, uh, the big majority of data is produced by companies, uh, other type of industries. Mm -hmm. But it's not that easy, uh, I think, to make the choices. I think we should make the choices, but we are still trapped in this idea again of the possibility of that data that is collected and released in the future. It's the same with health, it's the same with, yeah. That was great, thanks. Um, getting to the, to the morning thing at the end, I suppose the question would be, uh, who's mourning, right? So the assumption, I suppose, is that it's humans. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so maybe the question is more, it's not to disagree, but let's say to think the question of mourning. Uh, presumably the only way to launch kind of political action is for humans to already mourn their own demise. So that's the hint, hence the energy argument. There's a great fear in the species of being, of having kind of killed itself off. So the thought here is that a sort of, there can be a political movement launched on the basis of humans mourning the loss of humans, right? But to the extent that the human is, is the product of the data systems rather than yeah. user, then maybe it's a question of thinking, mourning, you know, th thinking kind of machine mourning and, and um, r risking, risking the thought of um, how to, how to uh, conceive of mourning as profitable. 
right? So, so how to set up a kind of um, sort of viral interest in in sort of machine mourning. So a kind of you know, for for, for example, if if uh, if uh, if I could develop a way of 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 getting rid of data within a data farm while not interfering with my efficiency of finding patterns in data that enable me to extract money, then I could run my data center more efficiently. So in other words, mourning could be, could be a kind of uh, software uh, yeah. kind of project. So two, two levels of it, right? One, the kind of um, big brother theory that mourning would put mourning in the hands of the big brother. And the other one would be to, to maybe just to de-center the human from the picture and maybe line up the bacteria and the other species. And I was so struck by your kind of more trans-species kind of read of Atacama, uh, where one could sense, and it was the microorganisms that, that were like the source of the lithium and so on. So I just I kind of, uh, as you know, put, Interested in bacterial rights, so <laughs> so if you kind of took took a bacterial rights perspective, I wonder if there might be um, sort of data management implications of kind of an e bacterial ethics. You know what I mean? Something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's. I mean, what I found it interesting in the case of the Kipu. It's fascinating, and we are trying even with algorithms to decode something that is not readable anymore. Um, so to me, that is a little bit a paradox that will happen with data, because finally there will be a huge agglomeration of data, perhaps beyond the human, right? So then the question of who is mourning the data, it becomes the question. And most of the times, these storage systems imagine apocalypse. Mm. So all the industry is based on the idea that data can survive humanity. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. To the point that even one of the most sophisticated mediums that has been discussed as data storage is DNA. Mm. So the DNA, in this case artificial uh, strings of DNA, it's a very stable and dense medium for storing information. But one could imagine that this information that will last for millennia, uh, all the information of humanity will last more than humanity. So the question of mourning, as in the kipos, is like, I could imagine what it will mean to try to decode that's not information the strings of DNA, artificial, containing the history of human, humankind, when human is not there, and bacteria <laughs> trying to read through corrupted files. I love it. <laughs> I think it's, a, you know, I, I don't want the apocalypse, but uh, this is what the industry is imagining. Like, that's why it's so important to keep files alive. It's not that it's more important the file that the human. It's more important the, your data than yourself. That's why we cannot delete it. And then the other question is like, I have, sometimes I, I, I'm tempted by partnering with Google and saying, let's develop a software to delete data, mm -hmm. you know? Why that first is that you have to choose what to delete and not that happens, you know, sometimes in Instagram stories or something that by default, things disappear, and it's only by choice when you ask things to stay. But yeah, maybe if uh, I'm not making enough money in uh, universities and curatorial work, I, <laughs> <laughs> I bring this idea to San Francisco. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think they're ready for you. Um, <laughs> I'm making a pitch, by the way. <laughs> um, just to think one last moment about this, the problem of mourning, because it's so beautiful the way you've described this, that we, are, we all know we're produced as data subjects, but we willfully produce 
ourselves as data subjects. And so letting go, mourning the data is also yeah. mourning the loss of ourselves. And it's such a complex narrative and, and beautifully presented and, and a great provocation and a great problem to launch here at the school, right, Canterbury, and for us to think about all our own data practices and our data politics and our data refusals. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.